Um, thank you for hurrying back from our little tiny break. I'm really, really delighted to um, tell you about um, the, the video. Um, yeah, one young man we worked with, uh, Shelly and I worked with, um, well, I worked with him for, first, and then Shelly and I worked with him. Um, he's made a video. He lives, he lived here for a lot of years, and he was part of our conferences. We did those 25 from OPP, and um, our whole team got the uh, Queen's Diamond, Diamond Jubilee Medal for the work we had done with the training and, and opening, bringing awareness to um, justice workers, police officers, social workers, and, uh, and other people who, who came to these, con these conferences. Um, uh, Ellen helped put us put them all together so we really worked great on this and Jordan was one of those people that you meet when I met Jordan he was 19 years old and he went to the gatehouse I was working there at the time and he went through their 12-week program our 12 our 12-week program at the time came out said I'm cured I'm okay now and then he went to um, are, are you making that no, no, sure. Okay. <laughs> then, <laughs> okay, you're ignored. Then he went through. Um, then he he went out and got out, and he said, "Oh my God, I'm, maybe I'm not cured." So he came back, and he went through the program again. By then, I was gone, and then he thought he was cured again, and found out about three weeks later he wasn't, and so consequently he went on about his crazy life, which was crazy at the time, and then he somehow at two o'clock in the morning, he found a flyer that apparently they gave him because I'd left the, the gatehouse, and he called me, and this, the shocking thing for Jordan was I called him back, <laughs> so he came into the group that, uh, that uh, Abuse Hurts Support, that Time for Men group that I mentioned earlier, and he was in that group for uh, quite a few years, and that was the gift of Time for men group that, that they could stay and still can stay until they're ready to leave. So this is Jordan's story. I'm, I'm really happy to be able to present it. He's, he's actually an award-winning filmmaker now and he's moved his, his yeah, and he's moved to uh, Florida with his partner. So here's Jordan's story. Are we ready?
Um, so now we have another survivor story. Um, Chris has generously agreed to come up here and share his story with us. So welcome, Chris. Hi, everyone. No, I'll, I'll kind of stand and move around a little bit. Maybe it won't make me as nervous. Um, first off, I am completely 100% unprepared for this. I was just asked to do this about an hour and a half ago. So no slides, no present point, a PowerPoint. I don't even have notes, okay? Someone once told me, if you can't dazzle them with your brilliance, you baffle them with bullshit. Here goes the shovel. So this whole thing is about the, the healing journey. And this is pretty much a little bit of my healing journey. I just started this just over a year ago at the gatehouse. Um, to be honest with you, I never really thought I had a problem. I was listening to, everybody was talking earlier, and I've been listening to a lot of the things. And to be honest with you, I never thought I was abused. I walked into the gatehouse and I had my, my, uh, my entrance with Brad, and I told him, I said, dude, I wasn't abused. I don't, know what's, I don't know why I'm really here. I'm just trying to figure out answers. So let's go back then. Born here in Toronto, uh, born and raised in the Blue Rose Village, it's on the other side of uh, High Park and the Humber River there. Born in St. Joseph's Hospital, lived in this area my whole life. So, lived on South Kingsway, had our house, had my grandmother's house, which was my dad's, my dad's mother. School around the corner, everything was beautiful. We had cottages, we had loving family, reunions, people always coming over. It was great, happy childhood. When my sister was born, who's three and a half, four years younger than I am, I basically lived with my grandmother. To keep her company, she was by herself. She doted over me. Like I was the apple of her eye. It was just fantastic. If I wanted cookies, she didn't go out and buy them, she made them. Fresh, right out there. I was eating the dough before I even went into the oven. So what happened one day was I was in grade five, so I'm about 10 years old. I come home. Just like anything else, walk into grandma's house, turn on the TV, watch cartoons. Well, you only had eight channels back then because, you know, you actually had to change a channel. Um, then she wasn't around. I couldn't figure it out. So I go to the back, grab my cookies, and looking in the backyard, I notice clothes kind of floating around the backyard. What the heck's going on here? Kind of look outside. There she is. Had a stroke, dead at the bottom of the stairs. So here was the person who was the most important person in my life, even more than my parents, even more than anybody else, gone. So now I'm trying to fulfill this void of emptiness and looking for the person now who's going to help me out. Played hockey, played hockey at a very high level, played football, baseball. Even with coaches back then, I think it was alluded to earlier, Big boys don't cry, get up, be tough, go out there, hit that guy, do this, do that. Everything was always negative, there was never any positives. So I lost the one person in my life that ever gave me any positives. My parents never came out and watched me play hockey, they just dropped me off at the rink, I did my thing, they picked me up, I went home. So I, I was really missing this void. Um, then what happened was, because my grandmother died, my parents decided to move around the corner sold both the houses. Now this is where it gets a little weird here. A gentleman who bought our old house, the place where I grew up, called me up, I was probably about 12 years old, and said, hey, would you like to cut, our, cut my grass for me? I'll pay you $4 an hour, just do light yard work around the house. No problem. I started doing that. Next thing I know, he starts inviting me into the house, I feel safe. I grew up in this place. I knew every nook and cranny. I knew every corner. I knew everything about this place. This was my old house. Why wouldn't I feel safe? Takes me down into the basement. You know, after a hard day of work, oh, let's give a little massage on the shoulders. Let's do this. Let's do that. Needless to say, things evolved. But now I'm sitting here in my house getting love and attention from this gentleman. I'm sitting here going, I don't have this at home. This is fantastic. So now what do I do? I come back. Can we go downstairs and get another massage? And this is why I'm telling you what I alluded to earlier, why I didn't think I was abused. 
I thought at 11, 12 years old, I had the power to sit there to make up my own mind that I was tricking this older gentleman, that I was asking for this. Was I groomed? I'm starting to figure that out now. And like I said, this is just my beginning of my journey, so I'm still learning a lot of this stuff. So now, now comes the gatehouse. And well, let's go a little bit, a little bit closer to this now. Um, because of this, now with relationships, I'm always looking for that next fix. That's my drug. My cousin, he came and talked up here and he talked about substance abuse, alcohol abuse, physicality, everything like that. And if anybody here knows him and tells him I go one minute over what he talked about because Lynn's not going to cut me off, don't tell him, I'll never hear the end of it. <laughs> so here I am looking for the next thing. One person shows me a bill of affection, I'm right there. I'm holding on to them as tight as I can because I'm looking for that. I'm looking to be told, you're a good boy. Everything's going to be all right. You know? So then, as I grew up, into my teen years and everything like that, relationships with girls. Same thing. I could have a girlfriend. But this girl over here kind of likes you. Hey, really? Let's go talk to her for a bit. Why? Because it's a different person giving me affection. So I couldn't figure out the differences between the love that I wanted and the love that I needed. So now, as this goes on, I get married, and it was rocky. And I was you know, listening to the last presentation, looking at a lot of stuff on there. And there was some abusiveness in there, and I can, I can look at it now. But once again, I was told, suck it up. A good husband is supposed to do this. Happy wife, happy life. Stop everything that you have to worry about do everything for the family. I stopped doing hockey. I stopped playing sports. I used to referee junior hockey. I, am, I went to two NHL training camps to be an official. That's all gone. 45 years old now, I lost my dream. Why? Because of family? Eh, maybe. But that was all the abusiveness of be home, do this, do that. So now I can start to recognize that and I'm starting to see the different avenues that come out. I was on that roundabout for years, going around and around and around in a circle. I was just digging a hole, going deeper and deeper. But now I'm starting to see those avenues as they come out. So my ex-wife wasn't giving me a lot of attention. <coughs> Ended up finding another girl who did. Had an affair, broke up the marriage, and then Kids were involved, everything like that. I tried to do everything I could for my kids, just like I did as a good dad. You know, and as, as life goes on, you go through a couple of different relationships and people that you think you're in love with you or you're in love. And I'm trying to figure out now the difference between love and lust. You know, the difference between Mrs. Right and Mrs. Right Now. So... <laughs> Um, <laughs> so anyway, um, basically towards the end of it, my last girlfriend and I, we just kind of started breaking up and going our different ways. And I told her about, you know, this abuse or non-abuse. I guess we were talking one day about sexuality and all that. And I said, yeah, you know, I guess I've been with a guy and this is what happened. They're like, she's looking at me saying, well, you were abused. I said, no, I wasn't. I asked for it. I was the one that would knock, knock on the door and say, hey, you know, just, you made me feel good. You taught me how to masturbate. You taught me how to do this. You taught me how to do that. That's not abuse. That's love. No, it wasn't. So luckily for me, uh, she works for the Canadian government. She got on a website, started checking around, and found me the gatehouse. So that kind of brings us up to the point I was bringing up earlier. Here I am, I'm talking in front of Brad, and I'm sitting here going, I don't have a problem. This isn't me. Then he told me, yeah, you do. So here I am in phase one. I decide, that's it, I'm going to come into phase one. Beautiful. Another thing that struck me on the last presentation, survivor's guilt. So now I'm sitting here and I'm listening to everybody in my class. I got ten guys. Don't know them from Adam. Sitting here and we're all in this 
safe environment and we're all opening up. I'm hearing about this guy with his uncle and this guy over here with a father and the person down the street and a priest and this and that. Once again, I'm sitting here going, why am I here? I asked for this. I have nothing in common with the rest of these people. I have nothing in common with what my cousin talked about yesterday. How can I be on the same par with everybody else? And that's part of my healing journey right now, is that when I say this, I say this with a little bit of trepidation. I'm not doing this to heal myself from the abuse. It doesn't bother me. Now, I've been told I was narcissistic. I've been told I am a little bit of a sociopath for thinking like that. Maybe I am. But the point is, I'm looking to fix my habits of what came out of it. I want to be able to walk up, see that road sign and sit there and say, this is one way, this is the other way, and I'm going to pick the right path now. And this is, this is the part that kind of separates me from the rest of the people that were in the gatehouse, which I've done phase one, phase two with. And these are people I talk to all the time. I text, I can call them. They can call me at any time of the night. They know that. <laughs> and it's just hard to sit there and to figure out this person had so much trauma. You see them crying. And I sit there and I say, this is not me, though. How do I fix myself now when I really don't know what the core problem is? And that's part of my journey now going on is educating myself and trying to figure out these little pitfalls, these little road signs. I know I'll never have all the answers. I got a lot of questions. Some of them might not be relevant, some of them might be. But at the same time, I just want to try to educate myself to become better. I'm starting to facilitate now in, in uh, next month, group one. It's going to let me go through this all over again. I'm going to try a couple of different things. I'm going to try to bring up some humor, some civility, you know, some brotherhood. And just try to see how things go because I'm going to be doing this over and over again. And maybe that's what I need. Because every day I'm always learning. So my journey isn't about my destination. It's about the time going in between. You know, I can sit here and say I want to drive from here to Vancouver. That's my destination. But you know what? If it takes me 25 years because I decide to go up through and go to Winnipeg and go up to Flin Flon and go over to here and go back into Moose Factory in Ontario and then over to Alberta and then it might take me 25 years to get there. That's my journey. The end result isn't getting fixed. The end result isn't sitting here saying, I did it. Here's my badge of honor. I don't know. That's just the way I look at it, and that's, like I said, I don't have really anything really prepared, so I'm just kind of babbling. <laughs> Thanks. So much. Thanks. That was um, Chris at the spur of the moment. The people that I thought were coming in aren't, weren't coming in, so I just said, can you fill in for a minute? And he said, oh, sure, I can do that. So... That was great. Thank you so much, Chris. Now we're going to take our 15-minute break. 3 o'clock we're going to start. We've got a panel. Uh, Shelly, we've heard Shelly being mentioned so many times, so finally you'll get to see her and hear her. And Ellen will talk. And, but before we go on our break, before we go on our break, Justin is going to talk. I almost forgot. <laughs> <laughs> Justin's going to talk about his journey and why he's doing what he's doing. <laughs> you didn't know that you did part? Ask me to say that. That's true. Thank you. Um, so my story is not anything actually relevant to this conference. I don't have anything really to share that um, is anything related to uh, to the theme of this conference. Actually, my interest in this area is more about raising public awareness uh, regarding the gaps in our services for men. And my background is in charitable advocacy um, on other social justice causes. So maybe I'll use that as a pivot to talk about what I really wanted a few minutes to talk about, which is public awareness, because we haven't really talked a lot about how these individual stories, not mine, but the ones that have been shared by, by others today, really tie into the need to change people's minds about some of the 
some of the taboo, some of the stigma that we're not allowed to talk about certain issues, and I'm talking about men's health and violence against men in particular, so just wanted to speak briefly on that. Um, I mentioned earlier that uh, our organization and others uh, involved in today's conference were uh, participants in a, con in a committee hearing that the Ontario government had looking at sexual abuse and, and other forms of violence. And one of the things we tried to get across to that committee um, was that there are many ways in which we as a society um, signal that we are uh, not interested in, in acknowledging men as potential victims of trauma, sexual abuse, or domestic violence. And we haven't talked a lot about domestic violence, so I'm going to focus on that for just a couple of minutes and give you some examples of some of these ways in which we send these signals. Um, so I'll give you three or four. If you go to the emergency room of most hospitals in Ontario, part of the intake process is to routinely ask women if they are there as a result of domestic violence. If you're a man, that's not part of your intake process. That's one way that we're signaling we don't care about male victims. Um, if you are in need of legal aid, uh, many of the legal aid clinics that are part of Legal Aid Ontario, which is uh, uh, fully or partly funded by the Ontario government, uh, legal aid clinics will not offer legal aid support uh, to men who have been accused of certain crimes. They will offer that support to women accused of the same crimes, usually crimes like assault and, and domestic violence. Again, there's a sense that men aren't really victims in these situations and women are not likely to be perpetrators. Um, the lack of shelters uh, for male victims of domestic violence, the, well, lack, uh, that, that, that doesn't say it quite clearly enough. There are no domestic violence shelters for men um, where men can go to flee violence and get the kinds of support services uh, that women uh, have access to. And there's not enough for women either. Let's, let's make that clear, but there are zero for men. Um, and I guess the other one is in, in education, um, in terms of, let's say, the curriculum. When we talk about consent, when we talk in sexual uh, educational curriculum, in particular about gender and about sexuality, we kind of reinforce this idea that there's a gender binary where men are the perpetrators um, who, who commit the crimes against the women who are always uh, innocent and, and, and the victim. So there are lots of ways I think we're sending these signals. And I think there are things we could do, very simple things, to try to uh, balance this out and, and to uh, uh, take down those barriers and those taboos that I was referring to. And again, it does come back to education. And I think that does tie back to this conference because telling these stories and making it clear that um, this community of, of male victims, survivors, thrivers, whatever, uh, word you want to use, that, that you do exist, you have a right to have your voice heard. I said a couple of times, w we're very interested in telling those stories uh, on camera if you're willing to speak publicly, and it's a way to get other people um, to, to, uh, to acknowledge that they're not alone and, and possibly to get the support if they're suffering in silence. I know not everybody's at the point where they're comfortable doing that, I, I respect that, but for those of you who would like an opportunity to, to share that story, then we're, we're very happy to um, give you that, that platform. So I want to get that out there because I think part of our project, not just as, as, as uh, survivors, but also as advocates and professionals, is we've got we to gotta start talking about this stuff um, in, with a more organized and a louder voice because we do need some policy changes. Um, one of the ones I, I forgot to mention has to do with the way the police often ex uh, investigate allegations of domestic violence. There is a, a gender lens, that's the language in the policing documents, a gender lens that, that police officers are instructed to follow where when they're called into a domestic situation, they're, they're trained to go in looking at it as though the man is far more likely to be the perpetrator of an act of violence. And we have heard countless stories, uh, dozens and dozens of stories, where a man has, we've heard a few in the last 24 hours, a man has been the one to call in as a victim of assault, has bruises, has, has witnesses, and he is the one who spends that night in jail. She's the one who goes off to the, to the hospital for treatment when all the evidence pointed to it being the other way around. So that happens far more times than, than chance. There is something systematic going on. And we've seen the documents and the instruction manuals that are being used by the police. So we know, we know what's happening there. Um, so what we do at the center is we do tackle some of these taboo 
initiatives um, around public policy and gender. But we also do social services, so we do trauma support uh, for male victims of of abuse. Uh, we do uh, legal assistance, because I mentioned earlier, legal aid won't work with men if they're um, accused of certain crimes. And so we have a, an open legal clinic uh, where anybody can come and get support if they can't get it uh, anywhere else. We have parenting and fathering programs. The program we're developing right now is called Fathering After Separation or Divorce. Uh, it is meant to preserve that strong father-child bond in cases, unfortunate cases of a, a family breakup. And we do peer support uh, and counseling, as does the Gatehouse and other, other important agencies. Um, so, and I guess the last thing I'll mention is, uh, back to the conference again, the theme of the conference, we're looking at working with the shelter system. I mentioned this last night too. In Toronto in particular, that's where we're located, but uh, not just in Toronto. Um, there are no shelters in the GTA and far beyond for male victims of domestic violence. So again, if you're fleeing a violence situation at home, you have really nowhere to go to get the, the shelter and the services that you need. And if you're a father with a child, then it is a, it is a kind of a catch-22 because you don't want to leave your child with, with an abusive mother, but there's nowhere you can go with that would welcome you and your child. So there's a real problem there. So what we're doing is because we, we, we don't have a shelter, but we do have the support services that I've mentioned, is we're looking to work with shelters to bring our services into shelters that will work with us. And Ellen and Lynn uh, have been uh, tremendously helpful in making connections and opening doors um, and just kind of endorsing this proposal because they know it's something that's badly needed. So we're looking for help. Um, as I say, we have services. If uh, those services can be of use to you or a loved one, but we're also looking for volunteers and advocates um, for the public policy changes that are also an important part of this initiative. I think I've gone over five minutes, certainly over three, so thank you. Eight more minutes. Oh, no, no, I only needed three to five, so I think I'll stop there, <laughs> unless there are questions, but um, the literature is there. You can read more about it on our website as well. But, yes? How did you get into this advocacy? Well, it's, it's a boring story. I mean, compared to, to what we've been hearing, it's, it's, it's rather banal. But as I say, I've been involved in, in charitable causes of one kind or another. I, I guess I tend to gra um, gravitate to causes that don't get a lot of attention, um, social justice um, uh, causes that, that tend to be um, things that I think are important, but there doesn't seem to be, for whatever reason, a willingness to, um, to really take them seriously. And being involved in other social justice movements, whether it's the gay rights movement or the women's rights movement, I always felt that part of the puzzle was men's issues and men's health. That it was, we were really missing a piece when we talked about women's rights or gay rights and we didn't involve men in their issues. And I see this as very collaborative, very much complementary to other social justice movements. You, you, you can't ignore one community or one population um, and hope to solve um, the, the big problems that confront us. Everybody has to be included in this. So for me, it was, it was important. And um, the founding of, of my agency was from people involved in these other movements, realizing that everybody would benefit if we address these issues. So I don't have a personal you know, experience, um, as I say, but it was more kind of observations and talking to a lot of, a lot of people that I met. Another question. Yeah. <laughs> Just going to get the story out of you, Justin. Um, what? What? Um, what? There's uh, no repressed memories. I. Pardon? There's, no, there's nothing repressed. Okay. You can try. <laughs> what barriers have you uh, have you have come in the way? What in terms have you of the advocacy. With the with this with, with this agency. Yeah. Well, I, I guess just the kind of um, kind the kind of barriers that are not atypical when you're doing something very new um, and something that um, is seen as a little bit, I, I guess the novelty of it I think was the real issue because people tend to have preconceived notions that if you are concerned about the well-being of men as a group that must be at the expense of, of women or at the expense of of, of gay people or, or some other group. And there's kind of a zero-sum mentality that to fight for the rights of one group will 
necessarily take away resources from another. And that's why I'm stressing that it's always been collaborative in my mind, both conceptually collaborative in terms of dealing with everybody's issues simultaneously, because everybody else benefits from that, but also more practically, that if we're helping men get through their trauma, well, they have women in their lives that are being hurt by that trauma, quite likely, and the same is true about women suffering through trauma. So both at the individual level and at the conceptual level, I think it's really important to tackle men's health and men's issues. Yes? Yeah, I'm wondering about that too. <laughs> I'm wondering about funding for my own agency. <laughs> funding. <laughs> yes, um, that, that is the big challenge for us. So far, we've established ourselves based exclusively on um, membership contributions and private donations. Uh, we are now at a position, being a year into this, we have a track record. Um, we have um, some positive accomplishments under our belt, and now we're using those as a springboard to compete for um, government funding, um, philanthropic foundations, that kind of thing, and hopefully diversify our funding base. But um, I'm not going to show you our budget because you, you wouldn't take our agency seriously if you did. Uh, we, we actually, I think we punch a lot, you know, a lot higher than our weight um, in terms of the, the actual financial foundation that we have. But we're growing and we're, uh, we're working with some other agencies such as the ones <laughs> that have co-hosted this, uh, this conference, and we're able to do, I think, do a lot in partnership. Yeah. And we're a charity, so we can give you a tax receipt if you're asking about making a donation. <laughs> I'm not sure if that's what you were getting at. Denise? What's the name of the organization? How do we contact it? Yes, that's a nice question. Um, <laughs> so it's uh, the Canadian Centre for Men and Families. And we do have a website, which is meninfamilies.org. All the programs and services that we host are, are described there. Uh, we're in downtown Toronto at Carleton and Jarvis. We're open six days a week, so you can always drop by and visit us. We've got some staff here today as well. Well, staff, volunteers. I'm the only one paid, unfortunately. But um, there's a lot of good people here that you can talk to and learn more about our programs. Yes. Justin, have you had any uh, success in researching uh, why uh, men's shelters in the past have not been successful? Because there have been men's shelters in the past, and I think, uh, and I've been around long enough to know and to see them start up and slowly wither away for lack of use. So mm -hmm. I think you're right on the uh, money about the awareness piece because there, there is a lot of stigma and uh, the awareness piece, I mean, that's what we were trying to accomplish through the work that we were doing across the province. Um, and, and that's one of the, the challenges, is to be able to support what, what would be different today if there was a men's shelter in Toronto, as there has been in the past, how would you see that being successful today where it wasn't 15 years ago? And just for clarity, do you mean a, a domestic violence shelter? Yes. Okay. I didn't know that. Yes, there have been. Okay. I'm glad you're mentioning that, I, and I want to speak with you in more detail later because we did quite a bit of research, admittedly, into what exists now across Canada, and we discovered that we could only find one domestic violence shelter for men. It's in Winnipeg. It's the Manitoba Men's Resource Center. We didn't come across uh, evidence of existing Toronto shelters. Well, not um, existing. Right. They're in, <laughs> yeah, they, they're in the past. Yeah. So, I, so we didn't find those. And I want to I learn more about that, obviously, to understand why they weren't able to, to, to flourish. Um, it is the public awareness piece. I think that the time is right now for reasons that it wasn't, we weren't quite there, you know, five or ten years ago. Um, and, and we can get into why I feel that way. Um, but I think, well, for example, the Ontario government does support male sexual assault victims, at least in a, in a small way. And I'm not sure that how long that program has been around, but I think that's a positive development. Um, and there are others, I think, like that. So, but it's going to have to be public awareness. Um, and that's a challenge, because ever since we've established ourselves, we have had some blowback. Um, as, as Lynn, I think, was, was alluding to, from those who uh, really uh, see uh, villainous motives in our men's health um, agenda. Again, it's that zero-sum mentality. And that is going to take time to, to break down, that kind of uh, knee-jerk reaction to our work. And I think we're progressing through that, um, but I think we have to be further along that particular process 
once we've established that kind of credibility um, that these issues are real through advertising campaigns, through conferences like this, through people telling their stories, all of these are initiatives that I'm, I'm, trying, to, uh, I'm trying to move along. Um, then I think we'll get more support from government, from the public, um, and have those doors opened. But right now, and I'll, I'll, I'll just make this last point uh, uh, quickly, um, the, the shelter project we're working on, again, it's not to open a domestic violence shelter for men. It's to work with the existing shelters. And I think that's something that hasn't been tried before. And so that, I think, could show, again, proof of concept. So if we work with a, a, a shelter that already is accepting homeless men, we know some of those men are there because they are violence victims. We're going to come in with our support services, and we're going to, find, and we're going to basically um, record the data, how many men use the services, um, and then we can draw some conclusions about how many men are in the shelter system overall who are, aren't getting services. So I think that can prove to people who are doubtful that men do exist in the shelter system with these unmet needs and that they are willing to step up and, and get support. So we're going to try that. It's an experiment. We'll see how it works. Can I take one more? Sure. I have a question in regards to, uh, like I notice a lot in downtown Toronto, there's a lot of uh, males in different situations. There's uh, undiagnosed mental health issues in males. There's addiction issues regards to males. Um, or there's even like people are not getting the right kind of medical attention for their psychological problems and are transient. Do you see your organization expanding um, to the point where some of the other needs might be addressed? Well, what we'd like to do is set up a hub of men's health services. Yes, as Anne yes. showed, it, it, that's a good question. Um, we're not going to do it all because we're a very small, modest organization, but the idea of the hub approach is we're going to do some services that fill real gaps, and I, you know, I've referred to a couple of them, especially with regards to male violence victims. Um, but where we're not providing the services ourselves, we're at least going to act as a referral agency, as a clearinghouse of information. We're getting men calling us every day, not just in Toronto, but really across Canada, and we're doing the research to know what's available in different parts of the country. So if we don't provide it, we can at least refer men to the place where they can get help. And then the last component is actually working with existing agencies to reform or amend their programs to do a better job of servicing men. And I could give you a couple of examples. Uh, one is an eating disorder agency uh, called Sheena's Place, which has been around for 15 or so years. Um, we know eating disorders also affect men. We also know, or Sheena's Place tells me, that almost no men ever walk in there. So we don't need to, I don't think we need to do very much to recruit men into the into that particular agency that's i think more of a branding and marketing issue we just need to understand why men aren't seeking out their services so that's something where with a little bit of work we can actually leverage the that existing agency and just get more men involved and i think there are other agencies in toronto in particular where i'm more familiar doing amazing work just for whatever reason not getting enough men interested in these services and that's also on the men right and part of our project is changing you know what it means to be a man we look at this as sort of a, a bridge where you have society on the one hand and its institutions and then men on the other and getting them connected so it's as much changing the masculinity norms as it is building the services themselves we know we have to do both maybe that goes to your question too about why men weren't accessing the the shelters is maybe they didn't think it was there for them um, so we've got to change them from both sides. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Is it okay? You got what? You yeah, I think so. Justin kept reminding me. I didn't get my time to talk. I didn't get my time to talk. <laughs> I said, I'll get you. I'll make sure you get time to talk. Okay. It's now 3:04. We'll take a 15-minute break. That gives us to 3. We'll, we'll take 16 minutes. That gives us to 3:20. And then we'll come back. We have our final panel, which will be Shelley, we keep talking about. <laughs> you are a movie star, <laughs> Ellen, and me. So you've seen me all day long, and now you're going to hear what I think about stuff. Anyway, <laughs> so take a break. There's still lots of stuff over there. Please don't make me take it home. Um, help yourself. <laughs>